Great. So today we are joined by Robert and Doug of Drum and Woodsum. I want to thank you both for donating your time to this workshop today, and we're so excited to have the conversation. So I will pass it over to you to get things started. Um, thanks, Rachel. Um, so we'll we'll do introductions, and then we'll kind of jump into our our presentation. Um, we do we do have some slides that we'll pull out because we have a number of scenarios we want to walk through that I think be helpful to read together. And then some illustrations after that. Um, so my name is Rob Lescord. I'm an associate attorney in at Drummond Woodsum Business Group. I, I do uh, community economic development work, specifically focused on do a lot of I do a lot of entity setup, um, mostly in the context of housing and real estate development um, and affordable housing development in particular. Um, I'll pass it to Doug. Thanks, Rob. Uh, it's good to be back. Good to see some familiar faces, and um, uh, yeah, very happy to be here. and Excited to give this presentation. Uh, I am. My name is Doug, as you can see from my name below the screen, um, and I'm a shareholder at uh, Drum and Woodsum. I specialize in general corporate law, mergers and acquisitions, um, entity startup, and, and financings and, and equity raises in the whatnot. Thanks, Doug. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and walk through some introductory stuff, and then we'll dive right into the scenarios. Um, so please let me know if you can't see it. Um, so um, today, the goal of the presentation is we just want to, we, as some of you were in our last presentation, we talked about equity investment and went over some of the considerations. And in following up with Sarah, we thought it'd be helpful to come back and, and, and put it to practice a little bit with some scenarios that I understand have come from participants in the uh, WBC, which is really great. And I think it's helpful. It was helpful for us as we fleshed this out. So um, the next slide, that's who we are. Just a reminder, uh, we as lawyers, remind you that this is not individualized legal advice. Um, it really is helpful to talk with somebody about your individualized goals. I'd also say too, that we don't really cover the tax considerations of the things we talk about here. And that's another piece of advice that you'd want to get as you're thinking about taking on equity or debt or the other things we cover today. Um, so again, we have six scenarios that, we, that we've that we outlined. Um, and we're, we're hoping that those help illustrate key concepts related to company setup and equity investments. And we thought it would be helpful after each one to kind of identify the key considerations and then follow up questions that as we read them, we had for you know potential. If, if you were to come to us with these, we'd, we'd flag questions for you and, and for your potential investor. Um, so with that, um, we're just going to dive right into the scenarios. Like we can, um, I'll read them out loud, and then we'll break down each one, kind of the considerations in each. So this one, we have a, a food manufacturing business. They have one retail shop and sell wholesale. Um, they're looking for $100,000 to open a second retail space and buy new equipment. And they currently do about 500,000 a year in sales. Um, they have a friend of a friend who's willing to invest uh, 50,000 in the business for some ownership stake. Um, they don't want any control over the operations of the business and they live in New York. Um, so working through this scenario, I, I just, just as level setting and starting off, um, what we're talking about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up on a few of the sentences here. So I'm going to jump around, but the first one is when we're talking about ownership stake, that's what we're talking about with an equity investment. So when we were thinking of ownership interest, meaning they're coming into your company and they're exchanging that for money, that's what we're talking about with an equity investment. Um, and I think it's helpful to just pull up as we did last time, just remind folks about the best way to understand equity is by comparing it to debt. Um, so equity is financial ownership often combined with some control, control over the business, and we'll go over those pieces in more detail this presentation. And then the right to participate, to participate in operations and profits um, and increases in the value of the business over time. This is contrasted with debt, which probably most of you understand, which is you have um, a fixed obligation with, um, with some sort of interest attached to it and a fixed timeline that you have to repay it. And it doesn't include the ownership interest in the company. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing there. Um, as, we, as we think through the scenario here, the other thing um, that we wanted to talk about is um, looking at the first sentence there. So we have a small food manufacturing business, right? So the first question that we want to, that an attorney would have for you is, how is your business currently set up? Um, so a company can be set up as, typically we, we see people have set them up as sole proprietor, limited liability companies, where you're the only member or owner in your company. Um, 
But it's also an attorney, this matters because it, it, you may have set it up as a C corporation, in which case there's stock ownership, or an S corporation where you, you have one class of stock or you've made an S corp election for your LLC and that impacts what you can do. Um, so I actually wanted to go over that, that as well. So that for an S, why that, why that matters and why an attorney is gonna look at that from the start is that S corps have limitations on the types of membership and ownership you can offer. So in a, in a limited liability company, there's really broad flexibility to offer different types of member interests that have different profits rights or interests in the company. Um, whereas an S corp, you, if you've made that election, there's limitations on your ability to do that. And so the first thing would have to be is you'd have to unwind that and you'd have to make, that's something that an attorney would be doing with you um, if you were gonna start taking on investments is addressing how you set up your company and how it impacts the member interests that you um, that you've taken on. The next thing is um, just want to talk about the control piece as it relates to the company. Um, so as we talked about, so the the downside to or the downside or the challenge with equity investment is it's really going to be a question of the control and the rights to participate of the person you're bringing on to, into your business. And so here you have somebody who says they want no control. So that would be a follow up question. Is that truly no control? So no control at all would mean that you can continue to do everything you want with the business and they'd have no say in turn and they, they would participate in the profits and the losses in the company only, only the financial pieces, but they wouldn't have say over say um, changes in what you decide to do with your business or how you move forward. Um, so the way the control can be determined based on what makes sense for you and your investors. So that's kind of a a first key conversation to have of, of setting expectations about what do they want to be involved with. So, for example, um, if they want only if if they want some control, it, it could be minimal. It could be something like they want to have a say over the fundamental nature of your business. So, if you're doing food manufacturing and you decide to change it to get into real estate, um, they would want to have a say over changing that purpose. Um, right to vote on changes to the company documents. Um, that's a pretty typical one because that might change, you know, their their rights to profits or other interests. So an investor is going to want to have a say over that. Um, and then the other really basic ones are right to vote on the dissolution of the company. And then a little more, and it can exist on a spectrum, is the right to vote on things like, do you take on an, a new loan of a certain value or a contract, of taking on obligations as a company? And and that can exist on a spectrum, and it's important to have that conversation with your your potential investor when they say, oh, I don't want any control. Well, what does that really mean? Because it, it could be the case that, oh no, they would they would want some involvement and 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 that's that's something that you're gonna want to address. Um, and I would just just back up that for folks who weren't in our last presentation too. All of if you may if you already have a limited liability company, you may have it, but all of this is laid out in say the limited liability company agreement or operating agreement, if you've seen that term, or in the bylaws or the shareholder agreement for a, a corporation. And that's where all this needs to be laid out. And that's where a lawyer can be helpful in talking about your goals and what you're hearing from your investor and then setting that out. So there's clear expectations for everybody involved. Um, the, last, the last piece just to flag with the scenario is we note that you need hundred thousand dollars for for your proposed expansion and this equity investment is potentially only for fifty thousand of what you need so one theme throughout this is when you're thinking about expanding your business um, this will be true across a lot of these scenarios you want to be thinking about the full picture of how you're meeting your project goals or the goals of your business so you you want to be careful about taking on an equity investment unless you also have secured the other financing and funding you need for your project um, and if you if you don't know how you're going to secure that, setting expectations with your investor from the start. Um, I'll, and I'm going to share my screen to, to pull up some of these key takeaways. Um, Doug, do you have anything that you wanted to add for this one? Sure. I would just note on the control aspect here. It's not you know they 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 may really have no interest in controlling the business or, or voting on anything, but keep in mind that they may still have expectations with respect to certain rights that they might have that don't 
have anything to do with control, such as information rights, you know, rights to see financials and or rights to it, say you're going to you've decided that you're going to take on more investment. Maybe they expect a right to participate in that next investment. So there are uh, there are certain rights that don't really touch on control that can still be very important to an investor and you. I, I, whether or not you want to give them a right to a, a right of first refusal, say to participate in the next investment, you know that might handcuff you to some degree. So those are things to consider as well. So a lot of, I, I won't read through this, the slides will be available at the end of it, but thinking about just reminding that equity is the financial ownership in the business, and that's going to be laid out. The rights associated with that ownership are going to be laid out in your company agreement. Um, paying attention to, and a, an attorney can help you determine the impact of a, a past S election and how to deal with that as you, as you bring on new investors and the nature of their rights. Um, and then having this conversation about control. Um, and these are some questions that you can use as, a, as you're approaching this and, and gearing up for a conversation with an attorney. Um, any questions on this scenario? I'll move to the next one, which I think is a good contrast on some of these issues, but also please chime in if there's questions. I don't see and any. From a evaluation perspective, if I mean, would, would you toss that back to them and say, well, what you, you want to give 50,000? Is there a quick and dirty way to kind of do a quick evaluation of the company? For a percentage? I, think at, I think at this at the, the stage that this company is at in, in this scenario, um, you're kind of pre a a formal way of, of evaluating this. And this really is a, a negotiation between you and and the investor. Um, now you if you want, you can you know use certain measurements, certain financial measurements and try to weigh it out. Like but but at such an early stage. There's nothing wrong with setting your valuation uh, as you see as fair and then negotiating it with that investor. I'm going to move to the um, next scenario, which is um, kind of a similar situation, um, but we're, we're talking about more active control here. So you have a small retail store that does about 100000 a year in sales. You have a friend competitor who recently approached you about um, she wants to buy into the business, help you grow, sounds terrific, um, and, but wants an active management role in running the business. Um, and so navigating that is kind of the, the key focus here. So this is in contrast to the last one where you, where you have somebody who doesn't want to play a role um, in, in the business at all and might just want some of the fundamental right, rights to, that we talked about of just on the more basic side. But on this side, when you're talking about bringing on a, a a business partner, a true business partner who's going to have equal rights in the business, it's important to keep in mind that they, they'll come into your company kind of as a co-manager or a co-partner, and they're going to have equal rights to bind the company and enter into contracts um, and let, unless you spell out clearly how you're going to make decisions um, together about the business moving forward. And so typically, there's some understanding that you're okay as, as co-owners, co-partners and managers, you're allowed to do basic day-to-day -day things with the business, but you'd really want to spell out where does that line stop between day-to-day -day and when does it become something that's more substantive. And, and this really comes down to, um, in our, you know, for a lawyer, our key, a key thing that we're helping you try to figure out is we're trying to figure out, okay, this is all rosy now, this is your friend, you, they want to accept your money, but what if you just have a disagreement? And so it's really important that as you lay out your company agreement where you bring on this other party that you're thinking about how are you going to address those disagreements? Um, this is true when it's two people, but it also could be true when it's when you're talking about even numbers of people, you have a concern of, well, what if people are split 50-50? How are you going to make decisions about managing your business? And so um, you have the kind of overarching discussion about control that we talked about before. Maybe you don't want to give them that control and all those things we talked about for the previous scenario would apply and you can negotiate how involved they are. Um, but if they truly want to be a business partner, then you need to think about how you're going to make decisions and, and where does the line stop between things you can just do and things that, that you both need to agree on. And then if you don't agree, this is where it's important to be aware of kind of the tiebreaker. The, you'll want to think about how you're going to address those disagreements. So most commonly, you have this concept of you appoint or a, a tiebreaker, somebody who's going to a third, a trusted third party. Yeah. Well, let me yeah. cut in real quick just to say that these are 
this is mostly this is most applicable where it's a you know it's a a 50 50 split in ownership so if this person came in with their fifty thousand dollars and said i want to be a 50 50 partner with you then these these is this is when you'll come to these type of uh issues and, and, have, and have to think these matters through the, the thing that you might want to do first to the extent that you can is make sure that you own 51 percent of the business or have 50 percent of the voting rights but I'll, I, I mean, I'll say that most of the two-person companies that come to us at their startup stage, most of them are 50-50, and they want to they want to start on an even you know, keel. So this is I, this is you know in response to those type of um, companies, which I, I would say are probably the most common of the two-member companies that I see. Yeah. So so having so figuring out and and talking at the start while you're still in a good term figuring out how you're going to address those disagreements is going to be really important and spelling it out in writing in your company agreement uh, is there's there's kind of standard ways we do it through the tiebreaker another uh, another approach you can do it although i think doug you i have i haven't seen this but i don't think it's that common is it's called a texas shootout provision where the party has the opportunity to either to offer to buy or sell at a certain price and the other party has to either accept to buy or sell and that kind of ends it in, in the disagreement um, in terms of kind of ending the partnership and coming apart, um, which obviously is beneficial to the person who has the resources to do that. Um, so I'll leave it, leave it there. Um, yeah, that's, a, then, that's, a, that's a nuclear option, but it's, you know, it's not bad to have it into an agreement with a, with a, se a second party, uh, especially if, you know, if you're a married couple, you're going in 50, 50 um, and then, you know, something happens to the marriage that also is going to affect the business. Having a way to get out of that business uh, cleanly and, and a Texas shootout provision um, is a is a clean is a relatively clean way to to, to move on from that relationship. So, the other thing that this scenario helps us think about is so you have two people who are kind of bring the same business experience together to the business, and so. Um, the other piece to think about as you're bringing on partners, and this applies to all situations, but particularly, you know, here is you're always, there's typically going to be some limitation on the ability to transfer that ownership interest. If your LLC agreement doesn't have that, then somebody can sell their ownership interest and without consent and all of a sudden you're, you're in business with somebody you weren't expecting to be. So it's really important to at a minimum, you want to require consent uh, of the other members or you as the, as the founder. Um, and then, you know, the other pieces too is if something happens to your business partner, they die, they become disabled, and their interest passes to a family member, you don't all of a sudden want to be in business with their son, say. So, so we'll also want to have provisions and think about having provisions that relate, that give you the right, the right of first refusal to buy out that business partner's interest in the event they want out. So maybe they want to sell it, or maybe there's a death or a disability, you want to be able to take that in, that company interest back. And there's a number of ways that you can do that, but typically some form of right of first refusal with some language about how do you determine value of that interest at that time. Um, the other thing related to transfers that are, are, are worth you being aware of as you're talking to lawyers and setting up your business is these concept of a drag along right and a tag along right, which is kind of as it sounds is if you have if you have the majority member interest and you want to sell your company, for example, um, this is a way to require the other owners to sell their interest too. So you could sell the whole thing as a package and, and you can move on and get out of it. And then tag along rights is if you're the minority owner and the majority owner is selling, you have the right to go along with that and, and, and ask that your, your member interests also be purchased as well. Um, there's more details on all of those, but I think the general concepts are worth being being aware of as you're thinking about setting up a relationship with other with other people and other business partners. Um, Can I chime in on one other yeah, one other sure. thing with with respect to this scenario? Yep. Um, let me. I'm just pulling up scenario two again. So, I think uh, um like the initial consideration here when you read the scenario is a friend and or and or competitor recently approached me and she wants to buy into the business. She wants to have an active role. So I think the first question is, do you want this? And is this the best thing for your business? Um, you know, having a, having a partner can be a great thing, but 
you should always be considering that at the at the outset. Like, is this you should run a pros and cons list? Does it make sense to introduce a partner and you know and split my business up now or not? So I think that that initial consideration um, should you know be thought about heavily. This this scenario reads as though someone you know solicited you and it's not the other way around. So it's not clear to me that you know what you want to do. So so make sure that you think those things through even before then jumping into all the considerations you need to think about once you've taken off. So, so moving on to the, our, our move on to our third scenario, I will um, just again, this outlines some of these, well, I actually add what Doug just said too, because this is a foundational question for you to consider is whether you want to actually take on that business partner um, at all. Um, but so moving on to the, the third scenario, um, which is uh, you have a farmer, they're looking to expand what they're trying to do. Um, they, and they have a food investor who's willing to purchase land for them um, in return for equity stake in the business. Um, they don't want operational control. They don't know anything about farming and they would, they would invest 150 K for the land. I mean, I think that the, the first and kind of threshold question is kind of understanding, well, they, you know, they say they want to purchase the land. What does that really mean um, from their, from the, your standpoint and from their standpoint, does that, it could look a lot of different ways. Are they giving the money to your farm company that you've set up and they're going to take an ownership stake in that? And then that company is going to buy the land. Are they going to buy the land and lease it, lease it to you for, there's a lot of, when you're dealing with real estate, there's a lot of different ways that that ownership could be structured. So if you're if they're coming in and, and they're investing equity, um, a lot of the same considerations apply. But it may make sense, and I think we wanted to use this scenario to talk about this may be an appropriate, you're talking about real estate. This may be an, a, an appropriate place to talk about, you know, maybe a debt arrangement actually works better here, where you're not giving them an ownership stake in, in your farm. And that might be what you would see as more conventional. So um, just a reminder that when when we're talking about debt, um, that that's a fixed obligation um, with where it's evidenced by a promissory note or a note, um, and and that'll have a it'll have a term when the final payment is due, and it'll have interest payments built in there. And that seems pretty rigid, and it is rigid, but there's actually a lot of flexibility in negotiation with a note too, and, and a loan. And so you can think through some of the factors there. What is the interest rate? Do you have a period where payments are deferred for a period of time? I, I can understand you don't want to take on debt that you have to start payments right away, but it's not uncommon to have deferred payments, interest only periods of payments, all those sorts of things that you might see. Um, if you've taken out conventional business bank loans, you might have seen that before, but that applies here too. And you're thinking about that with another individual, all those conversations still apply. You need business terms that really make sense for your, your, your farm and, and that for, for what makes sense for you. Um, the, the other thing is, is I think that the debt approach here, they don't, they don't want any control. So it might give them a chance to get the benefit of some profit, limit, limits what their profits is the benefit. Um, and it's a fixed obligation for you. Um, and so if you're, if they're offering you to buy the land for you, they may want to take, they probably would want to take some sort of security. Uh, and this is what, you know, and the security for that debt could most typically would be a mortgage on the land like you would have for your home, a home mortgage. Um, or it also could be um, a, a security interest in your farm equipment or other things on the property. And those are all conversation points to have with them about their, their expectation of if this is going to be a loan, what are they taking for security um, and what, you know, what do they want for collateral for that? And to, and to jump in on this real quick, the, the reason why debt would make a lot of sense here, um, it, and opposed to the, 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 the previous um, scenarios, is that when your business is a, a startup, you don't have a lot of assets typically to secure someone's debt. So they, make, they, give, they give you a loan and it's unsecured, which now you don't, you don't get the upside of equity, um, but you still have a pretty good chance of losing everything. So in this scenario, because this would run with the land, you, you secure this debt and now you, you really are protecting yourself. Um, whereas if they give you an equity investment, if this is treated as equity instead, 
they wouldn't get the security. The land would be yours unless they, you know, bought this land, leased it to you, and then they got equity, which you would want to negotiate away from. Um, so if they, if the land is yours and everything goes bust, you know, they're, they're not really going to see the same kind of um, money back in their hands if, if the investment doesn't work. So, so that's why this would be essentially uh, something that your investor would, would actually prefer over uh, an equity. And, and then the last thing that I would just say on the, on this scenario for folks to think about is when you're talking about giving security um, in, in the form of a mortgage or a security in, interest in your farm in, you know your farming equipment, it's really important to pay attention to and, and think about what your future um, debt or loans you might take on would be. So it might not be that uncommon to go to USDA and ask for a loan from USDA or ask for another bank loan. And if you have this mortgage on the property first, unless this investor agrees to what's called subordinated and may put it in a second position on, on the uh, over the you know subsequent loan or the mortgage that you get from say USDA or security on your farm equipment, then this would take priority and that might not work for maybe more advantageous lending you can get from another place. For, for, and that so that's something to consider and think about too is that you're looking looking ahead to the future. The way to deal with that is you could have you could negotiate now at this stage that they would agree to subordinate and put this in a second position um, if they, you know, if the time came and you wanted to take that money on. And so when we're talking about when we're talking about first position, second position, just to back up, that's that's in the context. If things go belly up for you, the the way debts are paid is it's based on who has which position on the collateral they've taken. So a first position mortgage gets the gets the value of their loan back. And then if there's any money left, then it filters to the second, third, or fourth you have. So that that's what we're talking about by collateral position. So a lot of institution bank, institutional lenders, USDA, they might require first position. And that's something for you to think about um, as well as you're looking ahead um, with the scenario. So all right, I think that's that's it on that one. If I, I um, we have a question, is that now? Yeah, I, I I can take it. In, I can take that question in between um, uh, three and four. Sure. Yeah, so, I think go for it. Yeah. I, I, so if you set up a if you're set up with the state, that would mean you made some sort of state filing. So I guess I, I'm a little confused as to what state filing you made. Um, but typically, it's not hard to. It's it, it's really quite easy to move from a, a single member, a sole proprietor to an LLC. They're taxed as a sole, a sole member LLC and sole proprietorship are treated the same by the IRS. You wouldn't need a new EIN. Um, you just, we would, you put together uh, an LLC agreement and you uh, set up the company, you set up an LLC with the state, which costs about, I think $150. Um, it, so it's, it's straightforward and, and you're not, you could you can easily pivot at this point. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Uh, am, am I taking over on scenario four? Rob? Yeah. Yeah. I'll pull it up. Um, so. Talk. Okay. Um, all right. I'm just going to read this out and then uh, kind of walk you through my impressions. I own a food manufacturing facility in rural Maine. We now distribute across New England and are looking to build an addition to our plant to increase production capacity. This will be about $250,000 build. We would like to raise half of that in equity. We have some local food investors who might be interested in our mission. Okay. Um, so when I when I look, when if someone were to call me and, and bring this scenario, my first question would be, well, it's a $250,000 build and you think you've got you can raise about 125 uh, through an equity raise. Where are you going to get that other 125? Rob already brought this up in another scenario, but it, it's really important um, because if you raise 125 thousand dollars from investors, you're doing that. Typically, you'd want you'd have a lawyer's draft raise documents, and they would say we're raising this for the purpose of X, Y, or Z. Uh, in this case, it would. Purpose X is to to build out this facility, and if and if you can't complete the funding for it, you either need to really prepare your investors that you plan on closing anyway and, and using those funds for something else, um, or you know be prepared to actually give that money back. 
Um, so, so there's a, that would be my first question. And that would lead me to my second question, which is, you know, your manufacturing facility in rural Maine, have you considered any potential grants or programs that might help you get there? Um, I, I think, especially, you know, in Maine, depending on your industry, you should be looking into what kind of grants and, and, and funds might be available to you, um, depending where and, and what you do. And, and lawyers aren't the best at answering that or figuring that out for you. That you, You'll find that out in trade groups and through business networks, but that would be something to consider, um, uh, you know, early on in this case. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And then my other my other um, questions would be with respect to these potential investors. Who are they? How many of them are there? Um, it, when you raise money, you need to be careful of following securities laws, which I won't dive too deeply into because it's dry and, and boring, and it's also not an easy. It's not easy just to spell it all out. But typically. An attorney um, will will steer you towards if it, you're not investing only through you know a very very close network of family and, and some extremely close friends. Uh, my advice to you would always be to only take investment from accredited investors, which are which are people that are wealthy, they people that make over two hundred thousand dollars a year or have certain other you know financial thresholds that they can pass muster. Um, so. So my question would be, you know, who are these investors? And what is your connection to them? And you know, are they actually viable? Um, because what you, if you don't take on accredited investors, you can run risks where if this goes belly up, they will have better claims against you, um, both in, at state and in, in federal court. So that would be. I we, I've ha had to have difficult question, difficult conversations with with clients in the past about, you know, they had this idea that they were gonna raise. Hundred fifty thousand dollars from, and they and they could get that money, but the money wasn't going to be coming from people that fit the requirements required by securities law, and and that can be an issue. So I just flag that for now, and um and when you talk to a lawyer, you know hopefully they'll be they'll be cognizant of that as well. Um, I think we can go to the next one unless there's any kind of questions with respect to scenario four. Don't see any so. Okay, scenario five, I'm building an app that currently has a few dozen paying customers. I need to build about $50,000 to build out a second, I need $50,000 to build out the second iteration of the app. I think I can leverage 25,000 from MTI, which that's a, um, that's a local, uh, what, what does MTI stand for? Um, Rob, you, you can help me on this, main something. Technology Institute. Maine Technology Institute, yes, and and so Maine Technology Institute can can pay twenty five thousand, and I need twenty five k to match. I know some folks in my network who be who might contribute five thousand each to help me get to twenty five k. So my if I was on a call with someone that brought up this um, brought up this scenario, my initial and first concern would be. Who owns the IP to this app, and, and what are you doing right now with this build out? So I would I would take a quick pause on the the what we need to do with the raise and make sure that you've got documents in place to to ensure that the IP that you're building is yours. Um, if if as I read it, they're they're they need fifty thousand to to build this out. So I'm guessing they're paying someone to help build it out or or to build it out entirely. So you need to make sure that that work that's being done um, is going to be owned by you at the end of the day and not by the person who's doing the work. And, and IP law can be really tricky. So that should be something that's on your mind um, immediately. Um, as far as the 25K to match this again, now we're falling into this. Okay, so you're going to get 5,000 from five people, it sounds like. if they, This is a smaller loan. So it gives me a little less heartburn if you're taking or, or the smaller securities raise in general, whether it's equity or a loan. So I get a little less heartburn if you're taking this money from someone who might not uh, fall into the accredited investor category. 
but generally I would still advise to do the same thing to make sure you know who these investors are and that they are, are, are they either are family and friends or all accredited. And then once you've vetted that and assuming that you've got the right type of investors and you're willing to move forward, the next step would be since there's five of them, you know, you're, you're negotiating a similar package with all of them. So, but you need to consider are, are one or two of them going to be involved in this in some other function or are they all going to be passive investors? You need to consider, you know, what rights they will all have relative to each other. The simplest thing to do would to make sure that everyone has the, the same rights and basically sign the same investment documents. And then you're gonna end up with a shareholders agreement if you're a corporation or an operating agreement if you're an LLC that really takes into account these investors, even though they've invested a small amount, you need to, you know, cover the things that Rob has mentioned already, such as drag along rights and and um, rights with respect to pre pre uh, preventing transfer. Uh, drag along in, in this instance would be very important. Say that you you decided that your value of the company is. Hundred thousand dollars, so you're giving twenty five percent away now, or or two hundred thousand dollars. You're only giving twelve and a half percent of the company away now. That's great, but if you don't tie these investors to a drag along later, if you try to exit, they could you know really cause problems because they could say, I don't want to sell at this price. I want to sell at a better price. Um, so even when you know you're talking about a small amount of money a relatively small amount of money, you, you want to be making sure you've got the, the right provisions early on. Otherwise, people, as we see this regularly, where people are scrambling to build out these provisions after the fact. And then you usually have to concede more things to make up for the, because you're now asking investors to be bound in ways that they weren't before without consideration. So that would be my position with this scenario. Are, are there any other questions here? Quick question, and if you answer, if you already answered this, I'm sorry, but is that the same if he took or this person took five thousand as a debt note that they would still have to be qualified? Yes. Um, okay. So yeah. So the to, to like the whether uh, whether you're selling equity or um, debt, uh, typically, I mean, the, the law is that those are both securities and they're treated exactly the same. Now, I have encountered law firms that treat them differently, and I think they um, have done that at the behest of their client who decides, essentially, who decides to tell people, um, look, I, I can sell you equity. I can't sell you any equity because I don't want to part with the equity because you're not an accredited invest investor, but I'll take a look. I've seen that done, um, and it's kind of shady. Um, so just... Uh, it, keep in mind that yes, generally speaking, even if it's a loan, um, you you want to be thinking about those um, those qualifications. Now, if it's a loan from one person, if you've taken a loan from one individual, that's almost always going to be considered, you know, a private uh, offering that that will just fall in. So you you'd probably be safe. If you're taking it from five, not so much. Um, uh, I think we can go to the next one. Yeah. I run a local media company and we are rapidly scaling towards national distribution. It will take some money to ramp up and there are several large corporations who might be interested in helping me achieve scale. I currently have relationships, though we haven't talked any specifics at this point. So this one is um, really broad and you can go a lot of ways here. Uh, you know, what? My initial question is, are you looking for an investor or are you looking for a strategic partner? Um, and, and how would you, you know, arrange that partnership? It doesn't necessarily need to be equity. Are you looking for a, you know, a sole distribution agreement with one of these companies that will help you expand or, or a license agreement? I, I don't, it's the, the local media company is a little vague. I don't know exactly what they do, but maybe they can license what they do uh, to a larger company and be and be paid um, some of their expenses to do that. So, so there's a there is a lot going on here, and you need to dive into the details. But it sounds like you're considering partnering in some way with a much larger company. 
Now, again, you need to think about, well, what do, you, what do you want here? At the end of the day, do you want to be swallowed up by this company? Do you want to be 50-50 with this company? I mean, it could, do, it could be a partial exit where this company takes 51%, you stay on as CEO and, and you run the day-to-day -day and you take a big payout uh, but the idea is it's no longer really um, or you know you could keep more and, and and figure out another way to do it but it sounds like this person is really ramping up and at that time there are going to be companies that want to take the majority of the equity because they see this now as a scaling uh, possibility the other question is do you want to be working with a competitor or do you want to find a financial partner instead if you're Rent, if you're at the stage where you're ready to scale up, you know there might be private equity firms that that aren't in your industry that might be interested in partnering with you, and they they'll take the same big chunk, but um, the uh, you'll be left with more control, I think, of the day to day. So this this is a, if you're at this scenario six, then you congratulations, you're already doing great. Um, but I need a lot more information to be able to tell you what I think you should do. Uh, I, again, like my initial thought would be, if you want to own this company 100% down the road, then you should consider engaging one of these corporations in, a, in an exclusive distribution or license agreement where maybe they front some of the upfront costs for ramping up and you give them some back-end payments that looks similar to sharing profits, but can be ended after a certain amount of time. Um, you could also consider entering into a joint venture with one of these companies where you essentially form a, an entirely new entity. You maintain your entity and you form an entirely new entity for the special purpose of in, engaging in this, this now kind of combined effort with this larger corporation. So there's a, there's a lot of options here, but without knowing, without more details, and I'm happy to take details off the cuff and, and try to respond. Um, but but this is this is a is a broad and interesting scenario, but it's hard to give a give a completely comprehensive and and um, cohesive response to. Are there any are there any questions that we, we want to talk about in, in more detail here? We also we do have another scenario that was emailed to us, which I, I will also discuss momentarily once I find it in my email. But um, I'm happy to um, to respond to any questions with any of the any of the um, scenarios that we've already discussed. I have a general question, which is: At what point do you involve an attorney? So imagine you're just chatting with somebody, and they say, "Oh, do you need an investor?" And and right that second, I could call up my attorney and say, "Let's get together." But just in general, how does this kind of work? Would I start negotiating with my friend or family beforehand? Or at what point do you call somebody? Sure, that's a good question. Um, so generally attorneys, attorneys can't give business advice. So often um, uh, we get calls at, at the early stage and, and, the, and clients are looking for business advice and, and we have, we can only give so much there. So I think, where where you want to get the attorney involved is it you know once you have just you come to terms verbally that to, to some agreement before you put anything in writing you want to get an attorney involved for all of these scenarios um, now but but if you want to get an attorney involved before you've got anything in writing and just that you, to ask questions simply like is this market have you seen this before attorney can be very helpful there but that's really based on your confidence level like if you want to go this on your own to kind of figure out where you're going. I, I think that's perfectly great. And if I see something that seems way off market, I'll let you know in this, it's still a verbal stage. So I can say, hey, I know that this is what you've been discussing with this person, but just so you know that that's not market um, for reason, you know, X, Y, or Z. But you don't, I, I, I would say, it only becomes mission critical to have an attorney once you start putting things in writing. But that, that includes even like a letter of intent or term sheet because parts of those can be binding, especially if they're poorly written, they can be completely binding. Um, so, so you want to get an attorney involved prior to writing. Be my answer. Um, okay, I'm going to pull this email up.
Okay. I have been working on a new business venture and I was asked by a family member to be an investor. I assume, as I read this, I assume this means the family member wants to invest. I have been working on a new business venture and was asked by a family member if they could invest. I asked what she would be interested in for rate of return and she said she had no idea. Is this, if this, if this new business comes to fruition, my preference would be that it's a debt deal, not equity. Their starting point of negotiations, recommended, you know, prime rates, et cetera. And how do you come up with terms? I don't want to be insulting. I don't want to give the castle away either. So this kind of um, follows up with Krista's question a little bit. Um, as far as, you know, if you don't have any idea with respect to, you know, how to start these terms, like you, you know you want debt rather than equity, okay. Um, now, what percentage debt should it be? I, you can, I, I'm would be happy to talk that through with someone and, but there's a wide percentage. Like when it's, when it's a new business, it, it's really between the negotiation between the, the two people negotiating it. Like it, someone can get 20% interest and someone could get 80% interest. Um, I'm guessing this would be unsecured debt in this case. There was one more little clause here that I forgot to read, so I'll also fill that. Um, this family member also offered to loan my existing company money in a cash cr crunch. Our business has been has crazy cash collection cycles. While I'm incredibly appreciative of this offer, I've said no before because it makes me uncomfortable to be tied to one another financially. She also works for me just to throw in another kink that way. So I think there's, there's a number of scenarios here. One, do you want this person to invest with you at all? It seems like to be an initial question. And, and that no lawyer can help you with. That is, you gotta weigh the pros and cons of, of uh, having a financier, either a, a true business partner in equity or, or a debtor relationship with someone. Um, after that, you know, a, a, a attorney could, could talk to you about, you know, what they see is common. But it, again, in, in when you're dealing with one single investor and in a startup business, there's going to be a lot of variance. Um, as far as not insulting the potential investor, I think people are often a little too worried about this in business. Like, it's not insulting to ask someone, you know, to ask for what you want. And as well, as long as you're willing to negotiate and treat someone respectfully while you do it, you can set expectations and say, this is, this is what I would like. And then they all, it's also not exalted for them to say, well, no, actually, this is what I would like. And then you meet in the middle. That's what, that's what happens um, all the time. So it's okay to start where you feel comfortable uh, and, and then see what they respond to. It sounds like this person probably would rather have equity instead of debt if they work for you and, and, and and are already so involved in this business. Uh, so you might want to be prepared for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's totally fine to ask for what you want and it's not insulting. Unless it's, you know, unless you're asking for something that really is way out there. Um, I don't want to say there are no, there, there are, nothing is an absolute. There are things, there are ways that you could consult someone. But I, I think everyone on this call, I'm sure has the business judgment to, you know, offer something that is not going to be insulting. I would just chime in and say, and this is certainly not legal advice, but if that scenario came to us at the Women's Business Center, we'd also look at like, what can your business afford, right? So looking at the numbers, I mean, to Doug's point, we see interest rates vary widely on personal loans, but we want to make sure you land someplace that not only feels good to both of you, but that your business can afford. So that's, again, that's not legal advice, but that's a number of crunching that we would want to do with you to help make sure you land on a scenario that is going to allow your business to continue to be sustainable. That's a, that's a great point. And, and yeah, whenever you're taking debt, you need to be considering those, those are fixed obligations. So you need to make sure you can, you can pay them on time um, for sure. And you could also, I mean, there's, we haven't dove deeply into all the other types of equity, but, you know, there's other, there are other investments that you can do that are, you know, neither debt nor equity or a combination of both, you know, convertible node or, or a safe where uh, it's kind of the best of both worlds for, um, for a business owner. Um, but I think when you're, when you're 
that's when you want to get a lawyer and we can talk about this. Okay. Doug, that, that's what we had for scenarios. Do, do people have other questions on these or, or follow up comments or questions? Um, we have a few more minutes left. I'm going to jump in with one question that I recently heard. I think it relates to that scenario five, but it's kind of more general. Is there an advantage or disadvantage to, let's say you need a certain chunk of money to try to source that from one investor versus, you know, that scenario is five investors at $5,000 each. And Doug, you kind of alluded to that, but can you elaborate just a little bit? You said something about, I don't remember your terminology, but can you just speak about that dynamic of, you know, finding one person who can do the whole thing versus a group of people who can all chip in. Yeah, I think there are advantages on both sides. Although I, I think generally, from from the business owner's perspective, if you if it's if it's broken out among a lot of people and it's smaller amounts, you're going to have more control. Um, if you find one person who is going to give you a really big chunk, uh, they're going to be able to generally get better terms for themselves and and have more control over the business generally so so the best deals that i see um are generally when um someone's able to raise money through five or ten or fifteen wealthy individuals who all kind of chip in together um because there's just less individual negotiation less expectation for um kind of veto rights what you know rights to control how the business acts on the flip side, when you do find that single investor, uh, they often, you know, if they're big enough, they, they might provide really good resources to you that you might not find from the smaller investors. They're going to be slightly more sophisticated usually. Uh, so it, it might be a kind of a cleaner uh, negotiation um, all around. Uh, and, the, and their expectations will be, I think, more grounded um, than the investors that you kind of source uh through you know several people that you talk to um but i, I would say that the deals that i see that are most favorable to a business if they if a business needs three hundred thousand dollars and they're able to and they're able to find it from accredited investors uh and, and, and get it in twenty five thousand dollar chunks you're going to have more control than if you take three hundred thousand dollars from a single single person What I had told Nicole was that, you know, if you're taking a single investment, you might not need to worry so much about the securities laws because that would be a, a private transaction. Whereas if you're fielding a lot of different investors, now you've got to keep in mind the securities laws. Um, but those are, you know, as, as long as you've got adequate attorneys, those are, those are fairly easy to navigate and um, are not overly expensive. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that the fact that you have to pay attention to those should preclude you from from taking on investment from a lot, a larger group of people. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions for Rob or Doug while we have them? Totally fine if not. We'll give you some extra time back in your day. But I thought I would keep it open for just another minute. All righty. Well, I am not seeing any other questions. So I want to thank Rob and Doug. Thank you so much for a great presentation, great conversation, and uh, for donating your time for this workshop today. Thank you so much. And we hope we can uh, stay connected. And thank you everyone for joining us today. This was a lot of information and a lot to think about, I'm sure. So um, I'll be sending the recording and a follow-up email in addition to some presentation materials from previous uh, workshops that we've done on equity investments as well. So uh, thank you all for joining us today and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Everyone. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank, thank you very much. Bye.